Hello and welcome. This is the history of medieval philosophy. My name is Mark Thorisby and in this video we're going to be talking about the work of medieval philosopher and logician Peter Avalar. So welcome back everyone. I hope you guys are doing well. So first off, let's begin with Peter Avalar. He lived from 1079 to 1142. Here's sort of a drawing or woodcut of Avalar. Um, he, in a couple things, just to sort of start off with the background, is we're, we're going to be taking a look at sort of two of his works or excerpts from two of his works. Uh, first off is his glosses on Porphyry, and then we're also going to take a look at his ethics. Uh, we're going to mainly focus today on the problem of universals, which was a central problem for him, and really in many ways he organizes the problem for those who would come after him. Now, just a quick, quick reminder, within the Middle Ages, there's sort of two types of curriculum that students would have to review. The first is the trivium, and the trivium would cover grammar, dialectic, as well as rhetoric. And then there's the quadrivium, which is your arithmetic, your music, your geometry, and astronomy. And I know we've mentioned this before, but this is quite important, is that you essentially have, if you will, the language arts and, if you will, the sciences. And that's sort of the way in which the medieval curriculum was uh, articulated. This is important because of the way in which we see Peter Abelard, who is a well-known teacher um, in his own day and a really famous debater. Um, he also, we're going to see in the glosses, he utilizes or employs what's known as the science or the method of disputation. Essentially, it's maybe you can think of disputation as a genre within medieval uh, literature, where, for instance, the, the most, the prime example of the disputation method can be seen in the work of Aquinas in his Summa Theologica. But disputation essentially would work where, um, for instance, essentially students would, would go to lectures in the morning, they would memorize in the afternoon everything they'd learn, and then at some point they would be tested. And they would frequently, at least in the high, as they proceeded forward, they'd be tested using the method of disputation, where essentially you'd have one student who would argue a thesis, and then before they would, they would make a claim and give arguments for why they make that claim usually had to do with something about the nature of God or some sort of philosophical or theological problem. And then everyone else in the room or all the teachers and all the other students would then um, not just raise questions, but offer counter arguments and refutations or objections and then, or objections in this case. And then Abelard or whoever was sitting in the middle would then go back and then respond and refute each of those objections. And this was a very important sort of method. It's a great way to practice your own critical thinking skills. We don't employ it too much today within, um, within the academy, nor do we typically see our works argued but in, in or published in this format. Uh, but we will see this in Peter Avalar's work. So as you're reading it, you'll notice that it's very, very systematic. And as a consequence of that systematicity, Abelard is able to really probe in depth into a subject or anyone who does disputation in a way that they typically wouldn't have the ability to do. So it's one of the things that's important to know about medieval curriculum and the style of reasoning or the genre of writing that these philosophers would do and theologians would, would write. Now, <clears throat> as we mentioned today already, as we're going to be primarily taking a look at the problem of universals. And again, just to remind ourselves, the problem of universals is essentially the question of whether or not universal claims or things which are known to be the case everywhere or universal in some sense, whether those are just, whether those refer to some sort of reality, which is also existing everywhere, or whether or not universal statements are really just statements in words. And so nominalism is the position, roughly speaking, that the universals are not real. Um, but that they are words which do signify the claim of universality. Or as realism is the claim, someone like Plato will see that no, in fact, the universals actually exist somewhere. Now, one thing that's important here to know is that Abelard really is also highly credited with being the first major medieval philosopher to articulate theology in its modern and contemporary sense. Um, one thing is that Abelard, due to, we'll talk about this in a little bit, but due to a famous debate or rather trial of his, he would sometimes later be called the Socrates of Gaul. One of the things we will see is that Abelard's is the great one of the greatest um, philosophers of his day because of the rigor of his method. He was a very gifted logician. And in fact, uh, his work in logic has had a lasting impact, particularly uh, throughout the Middle Ages. But even still today, he's well regarded. Um, so let's talk a little bit about his biography. He was born in La Palais, or in Brittany, um, around 1079. 
uh, he was born into a well-to-do family, but he renounced his inheritance and ultimately his knighthood. Now, to be clear, he never was knighted, um, but he was on track to become a knight. Uh, but he gave that up in order to pursue philosophy. He actually traveled to work and studied with uh, the most influential philosophers of his day, which include Rosalind and William of Champagne. Um, and so, uh, who I just referenced here is W.C. Uh, and and this, so he was very, very famous for uh, debating. In fact, he was, he was famous over the debate over universals, particularly a debate which occurred in 1108, I believe against uh, William of Champagne. Um, and he actually never, quote unquote, lost a debate, whatever that means. I assume uh, it essentially means that he always can't. It, it doesn't mean that everything he debated, he was right about. But it does certainly mean that he was out over to uh, he was he was frequently able to overcome anyone he did debate, particularly using this disputation method we've mentioned. Now, in June 3rd, 1140, something really important um, happens to Abelard. And by this point, Abelard had lived in France and then he traveled back home and then moved back to France. And he was competing with the philosophers of the day ultimately to become his own great philosopher. Um, but, in, in, but in 1140, he was invited by Bernard of Clairvaux to have a debate. Uh, and of course, he accepted the debate because these two had been debating uh, important theological points for some time and things had begun heated between the two. And uh, Abelard thought that this would be a chance to finally settle the scores. Of course, he was always a good debater. Uh, and you see that in, when we read his text, is he's, he's very brilliant. He's also very witty, and, um, and so he's a forceful thinker. But unfortunately, when he arrived to actually have the debate, instead what he found was he was ambushed by a trial of heresy. And in fact, Bernard had organized, um, you know, on the behalf of the church, uh, a trial to charge him with heresy. He refused to take part. He was really upset, as you can imagine. He walked out and he immediately headed to Rome to appeal to the Pope directly. Unfortunately, when he got to the Pope, or actually before he got there, he did, he learned that he was already been ordered to silence by the Pope, and that essentially, although the trial never went forward, he was essentially condemned um, for on charges of heresy. Now, although he was ordered into silence, and he actually followed this order, from what we know is. He actually went to Bernard and they actually were able to sort of come to some sort of agreement. Um, and, but later on, the Pope would reverse the order and allow him to teach again. But unfortunately, this meant that because of this charge of heresy, Peter Abelard's work, although it's highly influential throughout the Middle Ages and he was highly read, it meant that the, his work was stifled in terms, of its implement, in terms of its effect on the broader world. And so in many ways, uh, the impact of Abelard was stifled or cut short as a consequence of this basically show trial. Um, and as a consequence, he actually had to live under the protection of Peter the Venerable at Cluny. And in fact, the, I believe it was the Cardinal at Cluny who actually called him the Socrates of Gaul because he was, he was a brilliant thinker and he was living in exile as a consequence, um, as a consequence of his thinking and his free thinking. On April 23rd in 1142, Abelard died um, and he was interred in Paris where you can still Go visit his grave. Uh, so that's a little bit, a very, very brief sort of tour, certainly not sufficient. One of the things that's cool about Abelard is that we actually know a lot about his biography because he wrote it down for us, uh, or he wrote many, he wrote much of his life for us. So we actually know a lot more details about Abelard than we do about other thinkers. Um, so let's keep going here. As I mentioned before, we're going to be talking about the problem of universals. And the key problem here is whether or not universals exist. Now, there's different ways to attack the problem, but one question here is to ask, what do we mean by existence? Another question is to ask, what do we mean by universals or particulars? Well, first off, let's introduce an important distinction we're going to see Abelard discuss. And this is the distinction between genera and species, okay? And, or if you will, in modern parlance, we could say genus versus species. Now, genus and species is an important distinction that goes very, very far back all the way ultimately to Aristotle, um, although he uses the Greek terms instead of the Latin terminology to talk about it. Uh, but a genus species distinction, just to start off with, you're probably already familiar with. Um, think about in biology, when we name animals, we name them according to both their genus and their species. So for instance, I'm a human being, and so that means I'm a member of this, uh, the homeo, I'm sorry, I was gonna say, of homo sapiens, right? So homo is the genus for a certain 
for a whole branch and a whole plurality of animals that have two legs, uh, though, though sapiens are the only ones that, so far as I know, survive. Uh, but yet Homo erectus and these other types of human-like, they were human in a certain way, uh, but they're part of the genus of human. Sapien is the current, is the species, and that's, of course, what I am here. Now, a species refers ultimately to a thing, and do things exist? Yes, obviously, they do exist. So, for instance, here we might say that I have a glass of water here, and so we can say that um, maybe cookware is the genus, and glasses are the species. Um, so, for instance, but one of the things we're going to see there, and then, of course, the species refers ultimately to some particular thing. Now, obviously, the things exist, but we have to ask ourselves, what about this genus and species? Because species refers to all, or Homo sapiens, the species sapien, refers to all members of humanity that, you know, conform to the certain categories, however biologists have defined sapien, right? And genus is Homo, which is a bigger category. So that means that um, if all persons, all human persons are members of the sapien species, then that means that species is itself something universal. And of course, the genus also must be universal. Of course, it's, as it were, a larger category. So notice that homo, and, I'm sorry, that genus and species here ultimately refer to something like universal categories. And so the question there is, well, is the genus really real? Or is the species really real? Now, on the one hand, we know that things are real. But what about this question about universals in general? How can a genus be real, for instance? Uh, because there's no thing which actually corresponds to a genus. And that's where we particularly see the problem. Now, next, for instance, consider what kinds of things seem to count as being universals. On the one hand, think about the word names of things. So if I could say use the word cup or glass, right, that refers to a whole category of things that sort of look like this, although there's many, many versions or variations. So names appear to be universal. A question we haven't looked at is whether proper names. So my name is Mark Thorsby. So you could ask, is Mark Thorsby as a name, is that universal? Because it's only the universal of one. But is the universal of one universal? Uh, and there's an in interesting set of debates that go on actually about that very question. But think here in terms of our own day, we consider, for instance, scientific laws to be universal. Uh, so for instance, we talk about uh, the law of gravity, right? The idea that um, bodies with mass attract and the larger the body, the larger the pull. So I'm living on earth, so if I drop something, it falls. This appears to be a universal law, right? So, but wait a second, if it's universal, what does it mean for it to exist? Because notice you can't look outside and see something fall and see gravity, right? You don't see a universal law. You don't see a law, in fact, right? It's rather something which seems to be deduced. And also there's, although Abelard does not discuss it, I think a really important question for us to ask, and maybe this is kind of looking ahead towards Thomas Aquinas's work, is the concept of being is also universal. Notice that we say that everything which, exi everything which exists has being, uh, but notice here is that the word being is highly abstract. It refers to everything. Well, therefore, all things which exist are species of the genus being, I guess. Uh, but wait a second. What does that mean exactly? Does, it, does being actually have existence per se? Or am I just getting lost and mixed up in my language? So notice here, we can already begin to see the pull towards nominalism to think of universals as words in some way. And think nominalism comes from the word nominal, which means name. Or it, we also feel a pull towards the idea that no, being existence must be real, but is that is the universal itself real? And we have a tendency to want to say that too, right? Um, because do these, we can, so we ask, do these things have existence? Because they're not things as such. They're not actually things per se. So let's jump here into the text here. We're going to be taking a look at uh, just an excerpt here on the problem of universals from uh, the text called Glosses and, on Porphyry. And I, I hope I'm not mispronouncing it, but we're talking about Porphyry of Tyre, who lived from 234 to 305 AD. And he's actually quite famous as he was a student of Plotinus. And he's actually the only person who edited the only known source of Plotinus's written works. Here's a sort of picture of Porphyry, um, a wood carving of him. Um, so he's a late Roman, or, or a mid, I guess a Roman philosopher, early Roman philosopher. It depends on when early and late starts here. But one of the things we see is that 
as early as uh, Porphyry, we see the question of universals being addressed or being raised. Now, it's important to know here that Abelard is also well aware of the things that Aquinas is arguing about this, as well as what Aristotle and Plato also talk about with regard to this problem. So it's important to see here is that Abelard is not writing in a vacuum, right? He's highly aware and highly educated regarding this problem and those who've come before him. Uh, so first off, let's sort of jump into it. The first thing Abelard does is he reviews some of the questions that get raised by Porphyry himself, and then we'll see that Abelard will then raise his own questions, and then he's going to go over roughly two theories about how to answer the problem of universals. Ultimately, he rejects both of those theories, and then he offers his own, which is a sort of, sort of, if you will, a, a sort of not that unfamiliar from the sort of one, two, three punch sort of essay that most of our students write. Okay, so here's some of the questions here. Let's pull these up a little closer. The first here is that we've talked about this is, do genera and species subsist or are they posited only? So the first thing is, do they actually have some sort of adhering subsistence in the world or are they something we just say exist, right? Are they just posited? Number two is, do they have true being or do these things actually just reside in the opinion of people who can think? That is, are we really just talking about concepts, right? Number three is, if they really do exist, then are they corporeal essences or are they incorporeal? Now, corporeal here ref refers roughly speaking, though uh, I'm sure Abelard has a precise definition for it. But think of corporeality as the idea of having extension in space, right? Um, so uh, as being with other things in space, if you will. So for instance, the, the cup here of water has a corporeal existence, right? And we, but we can say, for instance, that if I just think of the number two, that does not seem to have a corporeal existence because it seems to be just a concept in my head. So, so if there are universals, then are they corporeal or are they incorporeal? And, a, and a, another question that really falls under that same one, which is, are these things, if they're real, are they separated from sensibles or are they posited in sensibles? So are they something that can sense or do they have a different type of reality? Or are we actually saying that really they have some sort of existence as sensibles? Now what we're going to see here is that the first thing Abelard does is he adds another question. And he actually adds a number of questions. Um, and he's, review, he's sort of, if you will, having a sort of commentary on Porphyry where he's looking at what Porphyry argues. And then he essentially sort of, he doesn't stick too close to Porphyry. So he's not really trying to, he's sort of using... Um, the text as a launching off point to raise his own position. So that's why he has this other question, which is, so are genre and species nominated ad hoc or can their universality exist in the understanding alone? So in other words, so are we just making this stuff pointing and just naming things and that's all there is to universals such that they're not really universal? Or does the universality exist simply in the mind? Um, and so we're going to see him sort of going in that direction actually. Uh, so it's not surprising. Now, the other thing is here, I just want to mention is that he sort of chastises Porphyry throughout for, because the first thing that Porphyry will say is, here are the questions. And then he says, I'm not going to address those. And then he goes on. And Abelard's sort of annoyed, you can tell in the text by Porphyry here, because he says, wait a second, why are you raising these questions and then declining to answer? And he sort of chastises him because he says at one point, um, he's, uh, Porphyry seems to say, well, we don't, have time to talk about this and he sort of says they're saying that the reader doesn't have time well if the reader doesn't have time then what are we doing exactly um so he sort of chastises him for trying to for declining to answer these questions so you can see he's not really a fan of this guy um so and, and that's that's not a surprise most philosophers will do that they'll take another philosopher typically who's a lesser thinker and then use them to first discount their view and then argue why their view, whatever Abelard's view, is the one that will answer the question correctly. Uh, and by the way, Abelard, just to get it out of the way, he's a nominalist. So he's an important nominalist. So he doesn't think really that universals exist, not at least as substances, but we'll see that he doesn't think that they're just pure ad hoc either. So uh, Abelard's own position is a bit nuanced, uh, but ultimately he's going to, we're going to, he's attributed or characterized as being a nominalist within the history of medieval philosophy. Now, the problem of universal names is one of the questions here, right? A name covers many individual things. So, for example, take the idea of a horse. The word horse covers many, many different objects. And notice you can have brown horses, you can have black horses, 
and you could have white horses. So what we're talking about is that the word um, horse applies equally to all of these things which are different. So you see that we have a, a situation where we have diverse things are in agreement with the name, but according to what exactly? What makes the agreement subsist? So for instance, he says, do genera and species, as long as they are genera and species, necessarily have something subject to them by nomination? Or alternatively, even if these things, the things named are destroyed, can the universal consist even then of the understanding signification alone? For example, the name rose, where there are no roses to which it is common. So for instance, um, imagine, think here about the problem of species going out of extinction. So if we know, what's an example of a species? Um, think of um, the saber-toothed tiger, right, which is no longer exists. The saber-toothed tiger is a word, and it refers to many things, but it doesn't refer to anything which exists right now. Um, so does the word really have any, un can we really understand that word? Does it actually signify something? Uh, it's quite an interesting problem, because if you argue that the word has no meaning because there are no objects, then that means that we can't really have a credible concept of extinction, extinguished or ex um, species that have gone extinct, for instance. But we seem to clearly actually do have an understanding of what the saber-toothed tiger was. So this is sort of the problem of universal names. Now, Aristotle, the first one of the first things that he does and is typical of a medieval thinker is Abelard references Boethius. I remember we talked earlier about how Boethius is such a central figure within the history of philosophy particularly in the Middle Ages. And so one of the things that Abelard does, he says, well, let's review what Boethius says about Aristotle and Plato. Now, keep in mind here is that predominantly the only knowledge they have of Aristotle comes from Boethius, so they, um, uh, and, as well as Plato. So, the, so there's always a reference here to Boethius. Now, for Aristotle, the genre and the species subsist, but only in sensibles. Uh, but are understood outside of sensibles. So a universal is what is naturally apt to be predicated of several. That's what Aristotle says. And then uh, he also says, I call singular what is not predicated of several, right? So for Aristotle, at least from Boethius's interpretation, a universal is something which can be predicated of many things, um, right? And whereas something that's singular can't be predicated of many things, it can only be predicated of something which is single or singular. Now, um, Plato's view was that they're under that they're both understood and they exist outside of the sensible. So Plato's view is that universals do exist, but that they exist outside of sensibility, and that the understanding of them also exists outside of sensibility, right? Uh, but so if Aristotle thinks genus and species somehow subsist within the sensible things themselves. Now, we're going to see he's really going to begin sort of with Aristotle's position. Um, Abelard doesn't really go too far with Plato's position or seem to take it as seriously. Uh, but what we do see is that for Aristotle, things are contained under the name of universal. Now, there's an important thing that we have to mention that Abelard recognizes with regard to language. And this becomes very important later on, uh, particularly we'll see in modern philosophers, uh, modern logicians have seen and recognized the same distinction, of course, they use a different word. You can think about, you can go to my video on Frege, for instance, and we'll see the same distinction come up, though in a different uh, terms, right? So the idea here is that, notice that when we use language, we use words. Words are signs, right? So I have a stop sign here as an example. And of course, there's the word stop. Now, the word stop is just a bunch of squiggly lines, right? It doesn't actually mean anything in itself. The word stop means something only with regard to those who understand. So how is it that words function? Think of the word Abelard here. Uh, we have these letters that are in this certain sort of shape, but somehow they refer, they symbolize an actual person who used to exist. But on the other hand, we also recognize that the words exist in this symbolic form. So for instance, when we talk about words, we can say that words have do, they have the work of showing, but we cannot talk about the idea of things which are signified. So when words show, the showing belongs to the words, whereas the things which are being signified belong to the things. So for instance, when we talk about the word, the word has, has a certain visual matrice that we recognize, and so it shows us something, but what's signified by that showing belongs to the things, whereas the showing belongs to the words. Now, I know that seems sort of uh, maybe 
uh, nitpicky, but it actually proves to be a very, very important distinction in order to understand the function of language. Notice that when someone says you should stop at the stop sign, they don't mean you should stop, or when someone says that a stop sign has meaning, let's say, or is a meaningful thing, someone recognizes a stop sign versus maybe someone from another country who doesn't speak English and doesn't recognize what these words mean. Um, here, for instance, the person who doesn't have the language can see the showing, but they lack the signification. So language has to operate according to this, at least in some degree. Now, a name, though, is not the same thing as a species. That's an important distinction that Abelard will make here. Right, Abelard writes, um, and again he says, he's quoting, right, the word name is predicated of several names, and in a way is a species containing individuals on it, under it. It is, the word, is not properly called a species since it is not a substantial but accidental word. But there is no doubt it is a universal, and the definition of a universal fits it. So on the one hand, a word does not seem to be a species correctly speaking, uh, but a name does seem to have some sort of universality to it. So the problem of universals um, is a problem for, the, for language in general. And we sort of see a distinction in words here that Abelard's making that I think is worth drawing our attention to. The first here is the distinction between a word can be understood because the word is substantial in some sense versus a word is merely accidental. Now, there's not a really good example of this, uh, but so for instance, where does the word uh, mother come from or mama? Well, one of the things that psychologists and, and people who study children and infants have noticed is that one of the first words that one of the first sounds that children can articulate is the, the phonetic mama, right? Or ma, ma. They can do that soon. They can make that sound easily. So in a certain way, that word has a more substantial relationship. Uh, the other day, someone texted me and they texted me PFFT. And I'd never seen that, so I didn't know what it was. I thought it was an acronym, right? Uh, but then they wrote me back and said, no, it's not an acronym. It means poofed or poofed or something like that. In other words, they were trying to use the words in a substantial sense, but I understood it in terms of the accidental sense, namely the idea that the word is not actually tied to the thing, right? The word is just something we've applied secondarily to an object or to a thing. But here we have to ask this question, okay, back to universals. How exactly, if a name is universal in some sense, how can we adapt the concept of universal to things themselves? Because notice here that a thing is not universal, right? So here's my watch. I have a watch right here, right? This is a thing, at least it's a thing for me. I can feel it. It's substantial, right? So when I say the word watch, right, that name is universal to all of the things that fall under, this, under that category, which include this thing. So how exactly does the concept of universality apply to something which is quite non-universal because it's singular. So how can we adapt this concept to things? Now we're going to see Abelard really trying to address this question. First, he's going to look at one possibility, and this is the first theory. And this is really one, what well, you might say is something like the theory of forms, where you have a universal form and then you have many imperfect versions of it. So under this theory, what we could say is that maybe the way that the universal applies to things is to say that there is one perfect idea, perfect definition of what a watch is, and then all of these other particular things are just sort of bad copies, bad versions of that, of that universal form. Of course, if you're thinking about Plato's, Plato's own theory, which is, of course, what Abelard is thinking about right there, is that Plato's theory is that there really is a transcendental form that exists in a transcendental realm of some sort, and that that singular form is what allows... Um, for us to make comprehensive sense of all these other versions of things. So for instance, I have right here, I'm doing, working on a project in my garage where I'm putting up new light, light things, uh, light, uh, light bulb holders. And so here are the light bulb holders here. Notice that, that I can call these, um, this is a lamp holder, I have four of them. So is there a perfect form of lamp holderness? And then each of these are just exemplar objects. They're sort of imperfect versions um, in some way. That's one possibility for answering the question. Now, a second thing to consider here is that we can posit one and essentially the same substance in differing species. So we could posit that there's one ultimate universal form, and then we essentially have the same substance, but it's just in these sorts of different species. The examples he gives here is, for instance, an animal in differing animals is the same. 
So for instance, if we talk about a horse, we talk about a monkey, we talk about a bird, uh, we talk about a fish, and we talk about a human, all of those things are animals. And they're all equally animals. So the, the word and the concept of animal applies to all of them. Um, but how is that the, each one of those things encapsulates the animality, right? And so here's sort of a problem. What is the universal form of animal? Because all the animals seem to be different, right? Well, it's one possibility is that you draw this substance into diverse species by taking on diverse differences. So what you can say is, well, the concept of animal itself has a diversity within it, and that diversity is abstracted, um, and that's what allows for the multiplicity of things. So in other words, one possibility is saying, instead of saying there's one universal form in imperfect versions, we can say there's one universal form, and that that universal form is essentially dynamic enough to allow for variations over time or variations um, contemporaneously. Okay, so this means that from this theory, it's the idea is that something is universal in its nature, but singular in its actuality. So something, uh, so the notion here is that animal is a universal, and it's, and it's the same, it's universal throughout nature, throughout all of these cases, but the, it's singular when it becomes actualized. So such that you can never have a pure animal existing. You can only have singular types of animals which have actuality, but that the universal does have some sort of reality in nature. So what are the objections to this, um, this theory? What are some of the objections? Well, here's objection one. Abelard writes, For if essentially the same thing exists in several singulars, even uh, then even though diverse forms occupy it, this substance brought about by these forms must be identical with that, um, with that one occupied by those forms. For example, the animal formed by rationality is the animal formed by irrationality. So this means that the rational animal becomes the irrational animal. So the objection to the first theory is, well, wait a second. What you're saying is that, that if there's this pure form and all of us have these sorts of different versions and there's this difference in, in the actuality of things because of their singular nature and so on and so forth, it means that one animal can be rational and another animal could be also simultaneously irrational. Uh, this seems to be a contradiction. So, in other words, the question that Abelard says is, well, can contras reside in the same substance? Um, he says, no, because if they do reside, then they cannot be contraries. And contraries cannot be non-contraries at the same time. That, too, is a contradiction. We're going to see Abelard offer a sort of refutation against this theory, uh, or he's going to reply to it. And the first thing is he says, but wait a second, take Socrates. So here's a version, a pic, someone's picture of Socrates. But Socrates has both rationality and irrationality, right? Socrates is a human being, so he's a rational animal, as Aristotle and Plato would say. Um, but he's also irrational as well, right? That's why Socrates talks about the idea of trying to improve himself, right? Because he knows that he's irrational. So notice here you have rationality and irrationality residing together in Socrates. And that's not a contradiction because that's the truth. Um, and then he's going to talk about, he gives this example, I'm not going to go through it, but he talks about the distinction between Socrates and Brownie. Brownie is a donkey, right? And there he's thinking about Socrates as an animal with rationality. Brownie is a donkey with irrationality. And he essentially applies in that sense. The second reply that Abelard gives is that a rational animal is an irrational. Take that statement. When we take that statement, we can either criticize the proposition or we can criticize the judgment, right? So we can ask ourselves, is the proposition itself illogical or is it that we actually have a problem with the judgment that's being made? And it's a name that we disagree that a rational animal can also be an irrational animal. And what we see here is that the words do not probably seem to show how the substance can be both. So in other words, it looks like the mistakes actually arise from the language. And then here's a refutation against this reply. Well, is that a contradiction is a contradiction, but surely forms attached to the same thing at exactly the same time no longer stand in opposition to one another. So you have a sort of refutation say, no, wait a second. If something is contradictory at the same time, it, something cannot be contrary simultaneously at the same time. Otherwise, it's a contradiction. Um, so for example, take Socrates and Plato. Both of these are men, right? So here's Socrates, or here's a, uh, 
sculpture of Socrates, here's a sculpture of Plato. Both of them are men. So they both have the same essence or category of being insofar as they participate in this form of humanness, because they're both human, right? So the word man or human applies to both of them equally, even though they're different. So we get this quote, right? For there is only one essence of their substance, just as is there, only, there is only one essence of their qualities, too. So this brings us, this brings us to our third objection to this theory, which is, well, how can we then recognize numerical multiplicity, right? Because notice that if I, I have a glass of water here, but imagine if I had 10 glasses of water, how is it that we can recognize they're all distinguished differently, um, yet they all have the same form, right? They all have the same form of waterness, or if I give the example again of this lamp holder thing, right? So there's an objection there. And you can see there's a direct correlation there with the problem of mathematics. Another objection here is, but the individuals cannot be produced by their accidents, right? Plato's being a man is not what makes him Plato, exactly, right? Um, so it's simply because someone's an individual um, and, they, and as an individual, they have certain features, their features, um, their features are not what make them individuals, right? Um, so Socrates is not his accidents, right? Socrates is not just the person with the snub nose or the person with uh, the long beard, etc. or he's short, I believe. So Socrates, but then also consider that Socrates cannot exist apart from the accidents that he has. So for instance, I'm here, I have different features. I have a beard, I have blue eyes, I'm wearing glasses, I have hair, and so on and so forth. I have a nose. But notice here is that I can't exist without these things, even though these things are not essential to who or what I am as a human being. So accidents are not in the individual substances as they're in the subjects. Now there's an important distinction here between the idea of substance, which is a sort of metaphysical or physical description of me, I'm a substance, I'm a had existence. But when we talk about subjects, we're ultimately talking about language and the logical relationships of things. Um, so accidents are not in the individual substances as they're in the subjects. But if accidents are not in individual substances, they are surely not in the universal substances. So therefore, the theory in which what is basically the same essence is said to be in diverse things at once is completely lacking in reason. So hopefully you were able to follow that. It's a bit, um, there's a bit of mental gymnastics involved, but ultimately it's a rational thing. What he wants to argue is that we're ultimately making a distinction, I'm sorry, a mistake in our reasoning when we think, when we say something that, that somehow all of the, the essence of universal exists within the individuals, but in this sort of imperfect sense. Ultimately, the more questions we ask, the more questions are raised rather than answered. So this brings us to a sort of second theory. And let's actually read through the second theory. Thus, other people with a different theory of universality who get closer to the true theory of the matter. Uh, so you can see here right from the beginning that Abelard doesn't really believe in this second theory, but he thinks it's better than the first. They say that some things are not, um, not only are diverse from one another by their advening forms, but are discrete personally in their essences. And what is in one thing is in no way in another, whether it's a matter of form in the thing. They cannot subsist any the less discrete in their essences, even when their forms are removed, because their personal discreteness does not arise from those forms, but is from the very diversity of the essence. Uh, just as the forms themselves also are. So we get a sort of second possibility here, which is to say, well, okay, we have these words, but really they don't adhere in the objects themselves. What we have is that each individual has a sort of a form, but that there's discrete personal essences, right? So everyone has their own form. Essentially, we're moving away from Plato's theory into a more Aristotelian version. So in, there is a problem here with the, sort of there's a potential for an infinite regress argument here, which is namely, well, wait a second. If everything has their own diverse essence, that means that if I have one cup of water and then I have another cup of water, um, when I say that they're both the same cup of water, that's maybe kind of true, but really what we have is that they each have their own essence, right? Uh, they each have their own essence of discrete personality, if you will. Um, and then what I'm recognizing is the similarity between the two. But notice, and this is where we sort of get, get here, is so wait a second, 
that seems to raise the question of what we don't, when I say you have a glass of, there's a glass of water on the table, I'm talking about anything that looks like this. I'm not just talking about this particular essence. And notice there's another problem of language here, which is our words do not seem to re really refer all the time to the discrete personal essences of things, right? So there's a sort of interesting, it solves some problems, but it seems to raise other problems. Because individuals are diverse, not just in their advening forms, but in the discrete essence itself, right? That is, if I have another cup of water with ice and water in it, just like this, it looks like they actually have the same essence. So otherwise, the diversity of forms would go on to infinity, so that one would have to assume that yet others, uh, you, you have to assume that something else can account for the diversity of the other forms. There's another consequence of the second theory, which is namely that every individual is essentially different. So that the way in which two things, take Socrates and Plato again, the way in which these two things are the same is not a reference to the same essence, but a recognition of the indifference between their essences, right? So, okay, so Plato and Socrates are both men. And so that means that the, 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 they both have the essence of men within them, but they're discreetly different, right? But the consequence here is that, so when I recognize uh, that they're the same, I'm really recognizing that they're different. Uh, and that seems to be a bit of a problem. But Abelard does note that there's a disagreement between the proponents of this position. So for instance, is a universal actually a collection of things then? So when I say the word men, am I really just talking about a collection of beings that can count under that definition of men? Or if I'm human or women or whatever it is, right? Is the universal really just sort of kind of like a bag that I put all these discrete essences in and sort of tie up together? That is, is it a collection? And he thinks that he, did, um, I'm sorry, Abelard mentions that Boethius seems to actually hold this position, right? He writes, Boethius seems to agree with them. Quote, species is to be regarded as nothing else than the thought gathered from the substantial likeness of individuals. So you recognize things are like and you gather them together. Genus, on the other hand, is thought to be gathered from the likeness of species. So you have a sort of, you take a bunch of individual objects, you put them into one bag by the likeness or similarity, and that's the species. And then you get a bunch of species that look similar enough, and you put them together in a bag, and then you have a genus, right? And so genus on the other hand is thought to be gathered from the likenesses of the species. And Abelard says that when he says gathered from the likeness, he seems to imply uh, that a gathering of several things, right? So it's a collection of sorts. Um, so does that actually make sense? Well, one thing here is that others say that species is not only the collection of men, but it's the single individual. Remember, Abelard says that the second theory, the proponents of that second theory, are not actually in agreement themselves, right? Um, so is it a collection or is it a singular individual? Now here's some of the arguments against. Number one, and we're going to see Abelard takes on this position, is that he has offers a refutation against what we'll call the collection thesis. So if we take all men together and treat them as the same species, as the same category, right? And number two, the name human can be predicated of several so that it counts as a universal. So I take all human beings that I find, all persons, I put them in my, my concept bag, if you will, and then I treat them as a universal. And then they become a sort of species, right? Now, if the collection is predicated through the parts of its members, then the collection is not a universal type. Now, think about it for a moment. That means that if I am if I say that all of these persons I put in the bag count under the word human, but then I'm saying that the word human just applies to the different parts in any of the individuals, but not to the whole persons, then the collection is not really universal to all of them, right? But the species cannot both be and not be a universal. So what we have here is an arg the argument against the collection thesis is to say that, listen, a person is a human being, not because some parts of them are human, but because they're all human. And so that means that we can't just say we're putting a collection of individuals and just recognizing what's similar and then saying this part's similar for this person, this part's similar in this person, and so on and so forth, and then just at the end say, okay, they're all humans based upon their parts. But the problem is they're human all the way. They're not just human because some part of them is human. Um, so you can see here a species cannot both be and not be a universal. Otherwise, you end up with a contradiction. We have this great quote here, which is that 
every universal is naturally prior to its own individuals, right? The universal is logically applied to the entire category fully, right? But a collection of things, whatever is an integral whole with respect to the singulars of which it's constituted, and it and is naturally posterior to the things out of which it's put together. So basically what he's saying is a universal has to be prior to the individuals conceptually, whereas a collection is by definition posterior. That is, it comes after you have the things to put together, right? Now notice here is that when you go to the hospital, like go to the, the wing in the hospital where there's a bunch of babies who have just been born and they're laying in their little ICU cribs or whatever it is that they put them in their heating um, pods, and you can ask yourself, right, did we, does someone have to give birth for us to then, and then do we have to check the baby to make sure the baby's human? Notice we don't have to do that. We don't have to go and double check to make sure that we really just have humans inside of the neonatal ward or something like this. They're already human because the universal of hum, hum, humanity applies prior to them, um, not afterwards. But a collection always requires that the thing exist on the first. So, can the universal then be a singular individual? This is a question we raised at the very beginning. And here we see Abelard taking up that question for himself. Let me take a quick break here. He says, furthermore, since the things are granted to be entirely the same, that is, the man that is in Socrates and Socrates himself, there's no difference between one and the other, for no thing is diverse from itself at one and the same time. Since whatever it has in itself it has, it, it has in entirely the same way. Thus, Socrates, Socrates, both white and literate, even though he has diverse things in himself, nevertheless is not diverse from himself because of them, since he has them both and in exactly the same way. For he is not literate in any other way from himself or white in any other way from himself. So, too, as white, he's not something other than himself or as literate something other than himself. So, basically, here, we have to be a bit careful here because... Um, when we say that Socrates is a man and that he has these characteristics, he can read, he has a light, a white complexion, right? We will, we cannot say that, um, uh, that his, his whiteness is distinct from himself if that's what we know to be him, right? Um, so a universal applies to many things, but there's no many things here. And remember the way we define universal as something which combines diverse things together. There's no diversity in Socrates, and on 60, uh, section 62, Alvalard says, For if Socrates did not differ from Plato in a thing that is man, then neither does he differ from Plato himself. Right? So Socrates has to be singular in a way that goes beyond that. And so this means that this second theory is not really sufficient, no matter which way we take it, whether we take it in the first sense or we take it in the second sense. So this now is where we get to Abelard's own theory. What is his position? And this will be where we see Abelard articulate some of the core features of his own theory of nominalism. So first thing is that universals are not collections of things, nor are universal singular individuals, right? Because if it's a singular individual, then that means that the individual has to be multiple diverse things, even though it's only one thing. It doesn't make sense, right? And notice here that Abelard is taking that second theory and building from it, right? Um, he's building from it. He doesn't really go back to that first theory. And he'll go back to the problem of names in particular. And he notes that when we have names, some names are universal and some names are particular. So let's start with the particular name. A particular name is invented with an application to be predicated to several things one by one. Um, so they're particular. So the name applies only to one thing at a time. It doesn't refer to all the things at once. So for instance, imagine if I say the current person sitting in this chair, right? That's a sort of weird name, I guess. But that name is particular to me in this moment, but I can get up and you can sit here and that name will now apply to you. But notice that name can never apply to all of us at once, unless I guess we're all sitting in the chair at once, uh, which can't really happen. Um, so it's not, so names can be particular. By contrast, when we talk about a name being universal, what we really seem to be saying is that a name is invented with the application to be predicated to several things one by one. So, for example, the word man can refer to me and refer to someone else at the same time. So notice here, there, although Abelard doesn't discuss it, I think there's something interesting here 
which is concerns the role of time. Because it looks like universality is atemporal, or particularity seems to be temporal. Uh, so I'm not committed to that thesis, but it's an interesting question. And if you're interested in talking about that, feel free to uh, comment on that. So what we can say is that when we have a universal name, what we really have is we have one word with many significations. So we have one word, but it actually sh um, signifies many different things at once. And what we seem to have is a unity of signification um, rather than a unity of things. So now let's talk about syntax and predication. Remember, when I make in logic, if I make a statement, I say the grass is green. The grass is my subject category. And greenness is the, what I'm predicating of the grass. I'm saying that the grass has that essential quality to it or maybe that accidental quality to it. But essentially the form of predication is when I apply one category or superimpose one category onto another in some way. And so for instance, in Aristotle, we see Aristotle's categorical logic really articulating this and as well as his modal logic. This is a key feature and it's still an important function. Of, it's the central function of language, let's say, um, all language is the function of predication. But what is predication exactly? When I say that the grass is green, am I actually applying the category to another category or am I simply doing something in language? And ultimately what we have to realize here is that we can predicate things in logic, but that doesn't mean that those things are predicated in terms of things, the thingliness, right? The grass might not actually be green. So what does it mean to have predicated? Well, or what is predication? To be predicated is to be conjoinable to something, to be combined with something, um, truly by means of the expressive force of a present tense substantive verb. For example, man can be truly conjoined to diverse things through a substantive verb. Verbs like runs, walks. So I can say, the man runs um, to the fence, right? And there I'm predicating running um, and conjoining it and running in particular to the object of the fence um, to the original subject. So verbs allow us to do this, for instance. And there's a sort of copulative function here where runs tells us about the being of things, right? He says runs and walks, which are predicated of several things, also have the force of a substantive verb in its copulative function. A copula in logic is the word is, for instance. So if I say the grass is green, grass is the, is the subject, is is the copula, it's the, it's the thing which combines it to the predicate term, which is green. So whenever you have a predicate and you have um, a subject, you have these two categories, and you're trying to combine them, you need some glue. So think of it like that. The copula is the thing that glues things together, and it glues them through existence, right? Because when I say the grass is green, is, which is the copula, refers to the being of the grass, which is the, has the greenliness to it, I guess. So when I say the man runs, right? The running has a copulative function when it's a verb. Um, let me take a drink of water here. But notice that predication also concerns the nature of things. So if I say a man is a stone, that's a valid form of predication in terms of the syntax. The syntax refers to the structure of the, of the proposition in terms of its language. Um, you can go ahead. There's a more precise definition of syntax, but I'll just leave that with you. It's sort of the logical relationship of the words within a statement. So when I say a man is a stone, that makes sense. There's nothing logically problematic about that. It's a valid statement. It's a valid form of predication, but it's unsound. And the reason it's unsound is because a man is not a stone. That is, the thingliness cannot be combined in existence like that. A man cannot be a stone at the same time, right? Um, so notice here is that what Abelard's doing is he's using his own philosophy of language and logic to help us understand the problem of universals, to recognize that we can make universal claims or we can make universal predications in language, but that doesn't always mean that we have a universal predication in terms of things, right? They're two different things, two different things. And notice again, is the relationship there is also very similar to the idea that words show versus uh, referring to things which can be signified. 
So a man is a stone might show us something in terms of its baseline predication, but it doesn't actually signify anything meaningful, which means we don't understand it ultimately, right? So there's different types of names too, right? So you, first thing here is a universal name is not the same as an appellative name. Now an appellative name is any type of name that doesn't play the nominating role. It is not nominative, and I'll talk about that here in a second. Uh, it doesn't refer to a subject, right? And a singular name is not the same thing as a proper name, right? So a singular name, if I talk about balls, right? That's not the proper name of this or that ball. Right, so imagine if you have a baseball and it's sign and it's famous or something. You have a, a baseball sign, let's say by um, Mark McGuire, uh, that maybe you call that ball something, the McGuire ball, right? The McGuire ball is a proper name, but the word balls is just a singular name, or ball is a singular name. Uh, I guess that would be a plural name, right? So singular name is ball. A universal name is not the same as an appellative name. Basically here is that what we see is that is that from universals to singulars into proper names, we see something going from where, from a broader uh, predication into an increasingly narrower sense. So different names have different functions. Now for Aristotle, Abelard says, the oblique forms are less necessary than the nominative form. Now the oblique form is any case that is not nominative or vocative. Now here we're talking about the cases of language, in particular in Greek, uh, but all languages have cases. Um, English only has, I think, one case, technically, uh, because English is its own sort of thing. But we can say is that the nominative, when you put a word in the nominative form of language, it becomes the subject noun. It becomes the primary category of the thing you're talking about. Whereas the vocative is a sort of sacred form. Um, so, for instance, if you read in Plato's, um, in, in Plato's Republic when they say, oh, by Zeus's name or something like that, those are in the vocative form, right? That's the vocative form. But there's other cases too. So for instance, there's the genitive case, so the possession. If you say, uh, you say Socrates of Greece, right? Socrates is in the nominative, but of Greece, Greece is in the genitive, because I'm saying that, that Socrates possesses Greece in some way, right? There's the accusative form, and this is when, when I say Socrates of Greece eats uh, Slovaki, right? Or he eats lamb, right? Lamb becomes the object of the sentence. It's taken in the accusative sense, for instance, as whereas the dative is a sort of indirect object, something that's related, but it's not the primary. What's going to be important here is that the nominative form is the primary one we're thinking about with regard to these problems. So the only statements can make up an argument, right? So that's important too, is that whenever you have an argument about something, that argument is composed of statements. And those statements are composed of words. Some of those words are names. So therefore, the oblique forms shouldn't be counted as names because the oblique forms do not take up the role of statements. Uh, they cannot be used in the same sense. So it's not names, but the cases of names that ultimately happens here. So for the example, Socrates is a man down by the river. Socrates gets treated in the nominative sense there. So what about these universal words? It seems that universals lack a proper subject. And here is what we can say is that if it's universal, it applies everywhere. But since it applies only to particulars, then the word itself doesn't have a universal subject. It only has particular subjects, right? So universal words do not actually seem to signify anything um, exactly. So uh, Abelard says, so neither man nor any other universal word appears to signify anything for it does not establish an understanding of any thing, right? But it seems there can be no understanding that does not have a subject thing it conceives. And he goes on to quote Boethius, right? Every understanding arises from a subject thing, either as that thing is disposed or as it is not disposed. For no understanding can arise from no subject. You have to have a subject ultimately in order to understand something. But if universals have no subject, that doesn't make any sense because I do understand what universal means, or at least I think I understand. So this means that universal words signify in a way, not in terms of the understanding that arises from them, but in terms of establishing what pertains to them. So here's what Abelard wants to suggest is, okay, the universals don't actually signify a thing, but what they do signify is they, well not signify, but what they do is they establish 
what that word can pertain to. So they have a different, if you will, logical function. So that means that um, the universal word is not doesn't refer to the reality of a universal object or subject, but it does have a function. And that's the function of establishing something, of, of establishing what can pertain to it. So the word human doesn't explain the individual, but it does for us constitute a certain understanding of what, of what might count within a human. So this means that universals don't uh, reveal to us the thingly or substantial nature of things in the world, but they play a constituting role for our understanding of things. So universals count as a sort of common cause. They're as common, and cause here can be understood as an answer to the question of why something is the case. And you can say is that universals help us to understand things by constituting and helping us understand what pertains, but what they don't do is they don't point to um, some object in the world. So what we see here is that, is that Abelard has an epistemological model where we have senses, and those senses help organize our understanding in the mind, which means ultimately that you can say is universals exist in the understanding, but they don't exist in the, in the senses. And so we have here is nominalism. Now, just as the sense is not the thing sensed, to whoops, just now just as the sense is not the thing sensed. So when I hold this, the cup's cold, right? But the object that's cold is not the sense that I have to which it is directed. So the understanding is not the form of the thing it conceives. Instead, an understanding is a certain action of the soul on the basis which the soul is said to be in a state of understanding. So that means that the understanding is not a passive thing. It's an active thing. But the form in which it is directed is a kind of Im uh, imaginary and made up thing which the mind contrives for itself whatever it wants and however it wants. So the imaginary city seen in a dreamer like this, or the form of a building that will be made, which the architect conceives as a model and an exemplar of the thing to be formed. We cannot call this either a substance or an accident, right? Um, so that I love that example of the architect. So the architect has these plans for building a building. The building doesn't exist, right? So, but obviously the plans pertain to the building and they organize the building. So he's giving us an example here to help us get a sense of why, what he's arguing in terms of the function of language and in terms of the problem of nominalism and universalism, right? But the plans are not the substance of the building, nor are they simply accidents of the building. They're proto of the building, if you will. So universals are mental. They're not substantial phenomena. They don't refer to substances. They're mental things. So this is the position of nominalism. Now the difference in understanding between, there is a difference in understanding between universals and particulars, where a universal name conceives a common and a confused image of many things. So when I say the word man, I can think of a whole bunch of different things come to mind. And if I think of the word human, and man here can really should be taken in the most universal sense, which is to say all humans are men, strictly speaking. But let's not use that gendered language. Let's talk about humans, right? When, say, when I say the word human, a lot of things fall in that category, and it's kind of confusing. Some of those humans are going to be redheaded. Some of those humans are going to be bald. Some of those humans have four, two legs. Some of them have one leg, etc., etc. So universal conceives a common but a confused image of things in the mind. But the understanding of a singular word generates uh, the proper form of one thing. That is a form relating to one person and one person only. So thus, when I hear the word man, a kind of model rises up in my mind that is related to single men in such a way that it's common to all of them and proper to none of them. I love that. It's common to all of them and proper to none of them. Because why? Because the word man, as it's a universal, it doesn't signify, but it actually has an operation of allowing us to constitute. So it has a cons uh, constitutive function rather than a signifying function. So, but when I hear Socrates, that word Socrates, a certain form rises up in my mind that expresses the likeness of a particular person. Hence, by the word Socrates, which produces in the mind the proper form of one person, a certain thing is picked out and determined. But with the word man, the understanding of which depends upon the common form of all men, that very community produces a sort of confusion so that we don't understand any one form from among them all. So what does it mean to understand a subject? Well, 
If you understand a subject, it either means A, you understand the true substance of the thing, or B, uh, you have the conceived form of anything when the thing is absent. So you either have a particular or you have a universal uh, when you understand a subject. So that's why universals can function as the subject of our statements in language and within the, uh, within the statements we make in our arguments, even though they don't have a, a, a proper signifying function. Now there's a caveat for God here, which is namely that everything we've mentioned here does not apply for God, but that's because God um, God can conceive of all things and God has produced all things. So for God, the problem of universals is quite different. Um, and we're not going to go into that too much, uh, but he does mention that, which is in, uh, appropriate and important for him. Um, so this means that the understanding of a universal is, on the one hand, alone, because it's apart from sensation, it's bare, because it's an abstraction, and see, it's pure of everything, there's no discrete being. So universals are alone, they're bare, and they're pure, he says. Now, what's ultimately, back to the question of Porphyry, how do we make sense of this? What we can say is that, okay, universals do signify truly existing things by naming them. The same things are singular same things that singular names signify. So there is a way in which universals refer to things which are true, right? But they're not true in existence, not in the same, I should say, they're not true as a sub substance in existence. They're not, but they're also not posited in just pure empty opinion. It's not like we just make this stuff up. They actually have a function in a logical role. Notice here that Abelard wants to argue for nominalism but he doesn't want to say that at the end of the day, universals don't have a universal meaning, right? Because then you end up with a whole range of philosophy that we have to discount. Um, and think here about uh, Anselm and Anselm's notion that God's universal, for instance. What does that mean? Here, Abelard is beginning to uh, sketch out for us, if you will, the logical answer to the question. Number three, to ask is to ask a universal either to ask if a universal is either corporeal or incorporeal is actually a false dichotomy because nothing can be incorporeal. Universals are corporeal in a sense. They're corporeal in terms of their application to things, right? They're corporeal with respect to the nature of things, but incorporeal with respect to the mode of their signification. Next, universals are sensible and insensible in the same sense as corporeal and incorporeal because that which is insensible is nothing, uh, because all things which exist have sensibility, can be sensed, as it were, at least for humans. Um, so that means that A, they're universal or sensible in terms of the nature of things, but they're insensible with regard to signification. Now are you starting to see why he needed to make this distinction earlier with the stop sign, or that was our example, about why words both signify, but they also show. Universals play some, or somewhere in between those two. Right. So number five, universal terms do not signify discrete existence. It's particular terms which signify it discreetly. And six, it is the multitude of things themselves that is the cause of the universality of the name. So in other words, universality is ultimately nominal with regard to the particular things that exist in the world. But it doesn't mean that universals are not are meaningless and that they don't have some sort of truth to them. Here's a quote. The universality of a thing confers on a word the thing does not have in itself. For surely the word does not have signification by virtue of the thing, and a name is judged to be appellative in accordance with the multitude of things, even though we do not say that things signify or appellative. So here he wants to sort of argue that he's being consistent ultimately in terms of his in terms of the logic of this argument. So hopefully you can see here is that the Abelard offers uh, a really, I think, an important position with regard to nominalism um, and, and an important argument of understanding what nominalism actually is. Nominalism here is not the idea that universals have no meaning, but rather that universals have no signification to things in the world. But they are related to the nature of things because of the multitude of things that exist within the world. Okay. Let's move here and let's talk about ethics or knowing thyself. In this section, I'm going to be a little bit briefer because I really wanted to focus on the problem of universals in today's lecture. But first off, here let's start with vice and virtue. Now, something is a vice if it lacks excellence, and something is a virtue if it fulfills excellence. Uh, and there is 
for Aristotle's ethics, there was a whole range of different types of, there's uh, virtues of habit, there's also virtues um, of the mind, right? Mental, intellectual virtues. So what we can say is that when we talk about vice and virtue, you can either talk about the mind or you can talk about the body. A moral refers to a virtue of the mind for Abelard, not to a virtue of the body. So for instance, think about um, if you ever watch the Olympics or you love to watch sports, maybe you like watching rugby, right? Athletes can be really great athletes in terms of their body, but this is, doesn't mean that they're morally virtuous, right? Just because they're good with their body, right? They have, a, they have an excellence of the body, but that's not a moral. So a moral is ultimately an excellence of the mind in some way. It's an excellence of our conduct and the way our mind or, uh, organizes our conduct. So not only vices of the mind, not all vices of the mind are considered moral vices though, so this is an important caveat. So for instance, because I make a mental mistake, let's say that if you have a, you're teaching a child how to divide two numbers together using long division or something, or algebra, then what you're gonna see here is if they make a mistake, that's not a moral problem, even though it's a vice of the mind. Uh, so not all vices are moral vices, but all moral vices are mental. Um, so this means that mental vices, are, now he's going to say that mental vices, though, are not the same as sin, exactly. So for instance, he gives the example of being hot-tempered. So if you're the type of person who gets really angry and hot-tempered, that signifies you have a mental predisposition. But that doesn't mean necessarily you're sinning. Now, we're not talking too much about his theology or the theology of sin. What we can say is that a sin is certainly that which is immoral. Um, you know, and a sin essentially, there's lots of discussion about what exactly counts as sin. But let's just keep it clean and easy for ourselves and just say a sin is a mental vice. Or no, a sin is not the same thing as a mental vice. I'm sorry. We can say that a sin is something different from a mental vice, but certainly something which is immoral is a sin, right? So, but being hot tempered is also a mental vice, right? Uh, it's also a problem in your conduct. I mean, it's a mental predisposition, but that's not the same thing as doing something which is immoral, right? And here he quotes the apostle, I believe Paul, when he says that no one will be crowned unless he struggles according to the law. Now, wait a second. In order for someone to struggle morally, right, that means that they have to struggle against a moral vice. Uh, but if the struggle is good, then the, the, the vice they're struggling against, um, and while they're struggling it, cannot itself be a sin. So that means we need to be careful about what we think counts as a sin. So let's ask the question, what exactly is a mental vice and what is properly called a sin? Okay, a vice, he says, is something which disposes us to sin. So the con it's, But it's the consent of the vice which is sin. So this is very important. Sin, ultimately, in Abelard's view, is a function of choice, and it's a function of the will. Um, and we're not going to get in too far into the will, because he doesn't think that sinning is the same thing as willing, but obviously, if you consent to what's evil, then you're making a choice, and then your will is involved. So sinning is not the same thing as willing, but every sinning is a consequence of willing, as it were. So Abelard thinks we also sin uh, without having a bad will. So he thinks it's possible for us to commit sins even though we have a good will, right? So for instance, imagine sinning under duress, right? Someone puts a gun to your head and they say, or no, instead of the gun to the head example, imagine someone sends you a package and they say, if you don't um, go um, assassinate a political opponent, then we will kill your family. Someone threatens you. Well, there, if you go assassinate someone, that's obviously a sin. You're murdering someone. But you're sinning under duress. So you're doing it against your will. So you can have sinning against your will. And the, exa the example that Abelard talks about is a servant who murder, the servant who has to murder their master for survival, right? Um, they're forced to do it, but they don't want to do it. So sinning is not always the same thing as willing. Uh, but sin is, which means that sin is also not the desire, nor is sin the will. But it's the consent to vice. It's the, the idea that you agree to it. And it's only when you consent to something that we say you're completely guilty of something, right? So for instance, if you have, um, when I was in high school, a friend of mine, um, he was driving, he was driving fast, and he did a turn wrong, and his car flipped over, and the other person, another friend of mine, was killed, right? Now, 
he was he was, I don't remember if he was held for manslaughter or not, but there was a question about whether or not he should be held for manslaughter. But no one thought of holding him responsible for murdering someone. Why? Because we knew that he wasn't completely guilty. Why? Because he didn't want to do it. He didn't want it to happen. He did not consent. But if someone murders someone and they agree, they decided to do it, they consented to the idea, then we say they're completely guilty. Take a look at this quotation from Avalar. He says, now as for the things that ought not to be done, I don't think it escapes anyone how often they are done without sin. For example, when they're committed through force or ignorance. For instance, if a woman subjected to force has sex with someone else's husband, or if a man somehow deceived, sleeps with a woman he thought was, was his wife, or if by mistake he kills someone he believes should be killed by him in his role as a judge. So it isn't a sin to lust after someone else's wife or to have sex with another. The sin is rather to consent to this lust or to this action. So that means that, that sinning isn't the action. It's not the actual event, but it's the consent to the evil event. It's the, it's the agreement to it. Notice here that that means that sin is mental, right? Sin is not what happens in the world of things. It seems to refer to what happens in the realm of the mind and the way the mind understands the realm of our actions and actions in it. So the sin of lust is not the feeling of attraction or the desire as felt, but the consent to the feeling, right? So of course, you can think of the seven deadly sins here, um, lust and being one of them, right? Lust is not that, so for instance, he would say is that, because in Christianity, certainly in Christianity and in, in the Middle Ages, lusting is a sin, right? But what is lust, right? So if you are a person and you see a beautiful person suddenly naked before you, right? You can't control it. Maybe you go to the beach and someone takes off their clothes, right? And you realize that they're attractive, right? And you have a desire, you have a you feel a desire of attraction, sexual attraction, does that mean you're lusting? No, it doesn't. Not for Abelard. It's when you consent to it. It's when, for instance, you see that person and then you turn turn away. That's what he thinks is not a sin. But what is a sin is when you consent to it and then you, you, you stare at someone or something like this. This is when lust takes over. It's the consent to it. And that's where the sin arises. Now, he quotes Augustine here where Augustine says, that the law commands nothing but charity, but for but for and forbids nothing but greed. Here, notice that it's not the act, but it's the consent which ultimately makes the most sense here. Which means that intention, not action, is what is morally significant. So this is, becomes important with regard to modern philosophers later, because, for instance, modern philosophers such as Immanuel Kant recognize the moral uh, importance of thinking about your intention to do things. So it's not the action which is morally significant. That's not what Kant says, though. But it's the intention which is morally significant uh, in, in terms of it being a sin. So there's also a process of temptation to sinning and committing evil that Abelard sets out. He says, first, there's the suggestion of something. And this is when there's something that's externally directed towards us, right? Then there's the pleasure Right? There's the experience of it, and then there's the consent to do it. So imagine, for instance, someone comes to you and says, hey, maybe you go see a, a movie or something. And then after your movie, you're with someone and they say, let's go jump into another movie. Right? Let's steal. We only paid for one movie, but let's see two. So let's steal a movie. Well, the suggestion is externally directed. Then there's the, the temptation of it, which is the pleasure to do the deed. He doesn't think that's an evil thing to, to feel like, oh, that would be fun to do. Right? He says that the sin occurs when we approve of that pleasure, when we consent to it. So sin is the result of the approval to act viciously, to act in vice. Sin is therefore, uh, therefore not the will per se, but it does require a function of the will. And there's a number of other key ideas which Abelard discusses in his ethics, including the idea that God is the examiner of the human heart. And he also discusses the reward of external deeds, uh, to what extent external uh, uh, benefits should, should organize us and rewards. He also talks about the, the deed is good because of its good intentions. So this would mean that ultimately if you do what's a good action but you have an evil intent, it's actually an evil action. It's actually an immoral thing. So let's say, for instance, I help an old lady across the street and I help her... And everyone would see me and say, oh, he's so good. 
but why am I doing that? Maybe I'm doing that to cover up the fact that I just robbed a bank. So I have an evil intention. So the deed is good because of the good intentions, not because of the action itself. So the basis of a good intention is that the intention itself really should be good. And again, when we think about Kant, Kant says the good will is something which is always inherently good because it's, it's the intention which is really good. And you have to have a good intent, ultimately, um, in order to act morally. So that's a little brief, very, very brief tour of Abelard's ethics, but hopefully it will give you a sort of kind of uh, a sense of what he's arguing, at least within our reading. Thank you guys very much for watching the History of Medieval Philosophy. I'm Mark Thoresby, and I'll see you guys online next time.